Thanks, everybody. Nice to see uh, so many familiar faces and some, some new ones, too. Those of you who know me are, no, are shocked to hear that I'm going to talk about energy, uh, which uh, you don't have to ask me twice to do. So uh, I'm very happy to be uh, contributing to this program. As you all know, uh, energy, at some level, all of you know the connection between energy uh, and climate change is the principal link between human activity and, and climate change and the global carbon cycle. So uh, what I'm going to do today is talk about this in a, a couple of respects. One is look at some broad sweeps of history in what we call energy transitions, which are changes in the major types of energy we use and how we use them. And look at, in particular, the United States, what the nature of these transitions were, what some of the general causes were, what some of the general impacts were on society uh, and the environment. And then talk a little bit about what, uh, how the transition that we face today, the carbon, essentially, carbon slash oil transition, is different from energy transitions in the past. And what needs to happen to uh, drive this transition based on these, uh, these differences. And then we'll look at some, some barriers to making this transition technical, economic, political, social, uh, and so on. And then with some uh, ideas on what, uh, what needs to happen. So <clears throat> this is a, some work based, hi, come on in. Some work uh, that uh, Pete O'Connor, PhD student in the Department of Earth and Environment uh, did a few years ago. Uh, I helped, hey, laggard, hey. Jeez, all right, come on, come on, let's go. Bring them on in. Um, so <clears throat> Pete uh, constructed a database of energy use back to the colonial period in the United States. And what the vertical axis shows here is the fraction of total energy use in the economy that comes from different sources. And what you see are some, some broad sweeps in history when we change from one energy source to another. So back in the uh, late 18th, early 19th century, we were using uh, largely wood, the red line uh, at the top, which provided about 90% of the energy, and smaller amounts of other animate sources of energy, principally food and fodder that was fed to people and draft animals who did all the work in the economy, tilling the fields, transporting people, uh, and so on. Then <clears throat> came the first big energy transition, which was the rise of coal, the green line there, uh, which replaced uh, largely wood. And so you can see this transition really took off in the late 19th, early 20th century. And so by the time of the First World War, coal was supplying uh, about three quarters of our energy use. And this is the shift, for the, in essence, the, the root of the Industrial Revolution uh, when we shifted from an agrarian uh, society, uh, largely most of us were farmers or involved in the food system, to an urban uh, economy with industrialization. And the switch from animate energy sources, wood, animate energy converters, people and draft animals, to inanimate energy sources, coal, and inanimate energy converters, first the steam engine, and then the energy combustion engine, and so on. Then there was a, a second big shift where coal was replaced by the rise of uh, oil and natural gas, such that by the late 1960s, oil and gas combined accounted for more than two-thirds of total energy use, and coal had uh, dropped significantly. And there was this period, particularly in the 20th century, particularly after World War II, where we saw a massive expansion of the economy, not only in the United States, but other countries who also went through the transition from coal to oil and gas. So this was a period of very rapid economic growth, and also rise in population as food production uh, expanded, uh, expanded rapidly. Uh, a few other uh, items to note here, uh, this purple line down here is what's known as uh, nuclear power, or primary energy use. And you can see that nuclear power uh, bumped up in the 1970s when the first nuclear power plants came online and uh, now accounts for a little less than 10% of primary energy use and about 19% of uh, electricity use. 
So one of the things that I ask students to think about when they first look at this is run this graph out 50 or 100 years. And what is it going to, what is it going to look like? You know, if we are going to get serious about climate change, uh, as you know, and as I'll talk about, you know, the oil and the coal and the gas need to go in, in, uh, to a large extent. And so non-carbon fuels uh, barely register here. The nuclear power, which is non-carbon. Uh, non we have water power down here at a, at a few percent. Uh, solar energy, PVs, if you plot it, the width of the line would overstate its importance to the economy. So uh, we face some challenges in moving away from carbon, which applies a significant chunk of energy. Note also that things have been uh, coal and oil and gas were pretty flat for several decades. Unlike these periods where we're going through these sort of rapid changes uh, cycles, oil and coal and gas have uh, have stayed fairly steady at uh, nearly three quarters of our energy use. And so there's uh, this was, this speaks to the great inertia we have in our energy system related to uh, related to fossil fuels. So this is, that, that was. Oftentimes, what people typically think of as energy transitions, and it's a very supply side approach. How do oil, coal, and wood, and solar, and so on. But there's a whole other side of, uh, of the equation that's the end use side. Oil and coal, per se, are not useful. Oil and coal are important because they provide services to people, they provide heat, they provide light, they provide motive power, and so on. And so an equally important part of these energy transitions are on the energy end use side. And as you'll see, changes in energy supply and changes in the devices and, and activities we use them are a hand in glove relationship. They're mutually self-reinforcing. They co-evolve together. So the changes in energy use, the patterns of energy use and the devices we use drive changes in energy supply and attributing cause and effect is uh, is probably not a wise thing to try and do because they do uh, they do co evolve. So, for example, um, stationary and mobile steam power in the industrial revolution when it replaced uh, replaced wood revolutionized transportation and manufacturing. So, when we replace uh, transportation of goods with horsepower, so this is uh, the Erie Canal in Lockport, which is in the western New York State, located on the Erie Canal which connected the Great Lakes with the Atlantic Ocean, essentially. The Erie Canal goes across New York State, connects to the Hudson River, goes down to the Hudson River to New York City. So goods, especially grain from the Midwest, were transported across New York State with horses and donkeys uh, pulling, uh, pulling uh, these barges. Uh, great when you have water available. Very expensive to build the canals. Flowing water is also good, but it's only good when you're going in one direction, which is the direction that the water is flowing. And the steam engine erased all these limits. So it didn't matter where flowing water was now, because you can build a railroad track pretty much anywhere you want, stick a steam engine on it, as long as you stuff coal or, or wood into it, uh, you can uh, go wherever you want. So the cost of transporting goods and people dramatically dropped when we shifted to the, uh, the steam locomotive and also in uh, manufacturing uh, operations. And so, of course, when you bring on the steam locomotive, that increases the demand for coal, which expands the energy and use. So you have this self-feeding, self-renewing cycle where the expansion of the energy and use drives the expansion for uh, uh, the energy source. Another uh, important application of the stationary front were, were factories. So before coal, uh, the big advance in energy was when we learned to tap water power. Not, high, not water power for electricity, but water power driving water wheels, uh, which were a big advance when they were first developed because a water wheel can generate power much greater than a horse or a person. So a lot of the Industrial Revolution really started in England. Go look at where the, the, the centers are. And they're all on rivers where there are falls, where they could stick these water wheels and churn them and grind grain and make steel and cut wood. You just go here in Massachusetts, go out to central Mass and look at the towns that uh, the oldest town, there's Miller's Falls, Turner's Falls, everything. all the early towns had falls in their name because all the early towns were located on falls where they 
uh, hooked up these water wheels to, uh, to do work. But again, along comes the steam engine, and uh, now you can do work, you put a boiler in your plant and uh, connect it to machines and do work and uh, cut steel or make steel or generate textiles way faster than you could ever do with, uh, with the water resources. So, uh, Important interconnections there. Another example of the importance of energy and use was the development of the internal combustion engine uh, in motor power, power which replaced uh, horses in motor transportation. Way better, obviously, in many ways. So the greater advantage for people and industry to use uh, of using internal combustion engines increases the demand for oil, discovery of more cheaper oil, enables the car to expand, and so on. Again, you have this self-feeding uh, uh, proposition. Lighting is another great example of the importance of energy and use. For millennia, we read by candle. Uh, and then for a short period of time, we used uh, kerosene when oil was discovered in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, and then along came the electric light. So the arrival of electricity and, and lighting, uh, as well as powering industrial drives and transportation, gave rise to the modern electric utility, which is a sort of supply supply side equipment of the oil company uh, and the coal company. So the point of all this is to think about energy transitions as uh, an integrated mix of both supply and uh, demand. And as we'll see, I think one of the challenges we face now is that we typically think we focus on the supply side. Oh, we need wind and solar replace, coal and so on. But we need to also be thinking about what are the innovations on the energy and use side which are going to help drive adoption of these new low carbon technologies. So what's the same or what's different about the transitions we face now compared to the past? One of the biggest differences is that the environmental frontier is closed. And we went through that transition from wood to coal and we had coal spewing pollution out in the atmosphere, coal mining and all the other stuff. It was not that big of a deal. Well, it might have been a big deal if you were in the area where that pollution was happening, but on a global sense and national sense, it wasn't that big of a deal because our numbers were small, our technological reach was, was modest, and uh, CO2 concentrations were very low. So environmental considerations weren't really important. Now they're paramount. So one of the fundamental chain uh, differences of this energy transition is that it's going to have to be managed. It's going to be steered by people individually, as institutions, as corporations, as governments, to a low carbon future, faster than it would, it would go without that uh, directed effort. And as you all know, you know the, the big uh, issue is atmospheric carbon dioxide. Uh, the largest source by far of that is from the combustion of fossil fuels, oil, coal, and, uh, and natural gas. And this is the long run CO2 record uh, from the Vostok ice core record showing the uh, concentration of parts per million on the vertical axis, and again, showing uh, what you've all seen before, that CO2 concentrations are uh, high and rising, and are the principal uh, human contribution to uh, global warming and climate change. So the, the next energy transition has to be driven by, amongst other things, meeting human needs and all the things we want energy to do. Oh, also, and by the way, stabilizing uh, stabilizing climate change. So here's a graph uh, indicating uh, the emissions of, of carbon. The vertical axis is pentagrams of carbon, so it's 10 to the 15th grams of carbon. If you want to go to carbon dioxide, you just multiply by 3.7 to get uh, convert from carbon to carbon dioxide. And you can see, particularly in the 20th century, this huge run-up in, uh, in emissions, up to around nine uh, pentagrams per year now from various sources, natural gas, uh, oil, coal, and uh, also the production uh, of cement. So by far and away, the biggest source of, of carbon emissions, especially in the United States, is from the combustion, is from our energy system. So <clears throat> here's, the, here's the challenge that we face. And the challenge we face is that there's a lot of carbon left in the Earth's crust. A lot. And if we give the engineers of the world enough money and a blind check, they'll figure out how, a way to produce it in a cost-effective way. Guaranteed. 
And so here are some numbers just to illustrate this. So I'm going to go through oil, natural gas, and coal, and we're going to look at the different uh, resources, categories of resources, both conventional oil and gas and coal, and also what's called unconventional oil and gas, which are uh, little utilized uh, ways of uh, modes of occurrence of oil and gas that um, could be potentially tapped with new technologies. So conventional crude oil, for example, the technical recoverable potential. So this is an estimate by geologists of how much oil, conventional oil, so this is oil that sits down there in liquid form in a geologic formation and we drill into it and pump it out. Right? It's conventional crude oil. How much is technically recoverable? So how much remain is still left in the earth crust that we can extract, forget about prices, whether it's price effective or uh, uh, cost effective or not, but technically what we can get out with current or near term technology. And it shows the amount of oil in billions of barrels and that converted into energy. This is exajoules. Well, joules is a measure of energy. Exa is 10 to the 18th joules. Um, the world today currently uh, consumes about 520 exajoules by way of comparison. Then it also shows what we currently produce uh, in the world. These are all world figures. And then it simply divides this column by this column, which shows how much we, uh, the potential relative to what we produce. So just to give you an idea of how much is uh, left out there. So technically recoverable conventional oil, there's 85 times more than what we, we currently produce. If you move to unconventional sources, so natural bitumen, which is what uh, it's called in the press is uh, oil sands up in Alberta, Canada, um, is relatively small amount is currently extracted. So the amount we have available relative to what we produce is, is very, very large. Heavy oil, so this is oil that's very viscous, has high resistance to flow, which requires some additional techniques to get it out of the ground compared to conventional oil. Uh, most of the, a lot of this is in, in Venezuela. Again, uh, very large, we've only we barely tapped these two resources. And then there's oil shale. So this is a type of shale rock that contains small amounts uh, of diffuse amounts of organic matter. And you can excavate this rock, crush it, grind it, heat it, pour lots of water in it, and you can pull the oil out in liquid form from oil shale. A lot of it out in Wyoming and Colorado. And there's almost none produced in the world. Lithuania, I think, or Latvia, one of those countries produces it. Uh, but that's about it. So, and the, and the amount available is huge huge amount of, of carbon there. So if you look at the total uh, liquids, and these ranges are based on uh, uncertainty in the estimates, um, there's still a fair, a, a large amount of oil left relative to what we produce. How about natural gas? So conventional natural gas, so now we're measuring gas in volumetric terms. So oil is, uh, oil and gas are both measured in volumetric terms. TCF is trillions of cubic feet of gas. And uh, conventional gas, potential over production is about 120. Shale gas, so this is the, the whole fracking phenomena, which a lot of you, I'm sure, have heard about, where we've developed this. This is an example of how potent technological innovation was. Yes. So 20 years ago, nobody was talking about shale gas. I mean, the engineers knew that shale gas was down there. So this is gas that's held in really compact. Conventional oil and gas is held in uh, mostly sandstone formations where the pore spaces between the, the, uh, uh, the grains of, of rock are quite large. And so the oil and gas sits in the pore spaces and you drill into them by sticking a straw into a, a milkshake and you can, you can pull them out. Um, shale is, has a much lower permeability. So there's small amounts of gas tightly held in the, the shale. And you know, 50 or 20 years ago, it was way too expensive to get out. We knew it was there, but no one bothered to go after it we didn't have the technology to do it. Well, along comes horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, which together now has opened up a whole new resource base uh, and made this gas economically viable. And there's uh, huge amounts of, of shale gas, tight gas uh, formation, which is our gas held in uh, really low, uh, additional low permeability uh, uh, formations. There's methane associated with coal beds. So you can actually drill into coal and pump methane out of the coal beds. 
And methane hydrates, which is this weird form of gas, a lot of which exists in uh, ocean sediments where methane is trapped as what's called a clathrate, where it is, there's a, a, methane is held in the three-dimensional molecular structure of certain ocean sediments in, in a frozen state. And you can actually drill into them and convert that methane into gas and extract it. We know the gas, methane is there, not really sure what's technically uh, available or some guesstimates, but you can see that that's a humongous amount of natural gas. So again, gas, lots of gas relative to uh, production. Here's coal broken down between hard coal, bituminous, and anthracite, and lignite, which is lower quality coal. A ginormous amount of coal left, which is particularly problematic because coal has the highest carbon content for heat in it relative to oil and natural gas. So uh, lots of lots of coal left. So if you add it all up, you can see if you add up all the fossil fuels, the technically potential relative production is, you know, at, at current rates of, think of it this way, at current rates of use of these resources, if we were to develop all these unconventional sources, we'd have a 1,200 year supply. Now, produ production and demand is rising, so that's a, that number changes over time, but the idea, the point is there's uh, a lot of carbon left in the Earth's crust. So we convert that <clears throat> into carbon, so we look, measure the car all the carbon in the oil and gas and coal in pentagram, you can see that uh, the total uh, amount of carbon is about 15,000 uh, pentagrams, most of it's in coal. Again, it's a problem because coal is the dirtiest of uh, dirtiest of fuels, particularly in the context of carbon. And so, the total amount that we've emitted from the first time humans started burning fossil fuel, so everything to date, the amount of carbon we put in the atmosphere, which is causing all the changes we're observing in the global carbon cycle and the climate, is just 374 petagrams. So, yikes, <laughs> right? There's not putting that much carbon in the atmosphere. I don't know what, the, 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 I don't know atmospheric chemistry enough to probably couldn't all fit it in there, but forget it, we'd be in a different planet. Um, so there's a major challenge, right? Because the, the, we live and breathe fossil fuels. They are the lifeblood of industrial civilization, especially oil. So there's a huge energy using infrastructure in place, the way in which our cities are arranged, the relationship between where people live and where they work, and the structure of factories and so on, all, all we've all been weaned on, on fossil fuels. So the problem is this, that if we take uh, the uh, Copenhagen Accords warning that we want to keep uh, Future warming, um, is it future warming? It's total warming, or is it future warming? Robert? I think it's total warming. Total warming. So we've already warmed eight tenths of a degree centigrade since uh, the mid uh, 19th century. And so we're told that we need to keep it above two degrees C total increase before the wheels start to come off the bus in terms of the uh, significant erosion of this basic sort of life support systems on the planet, climate, rainfall, and so on and so forth. Um, so if that's true, then uh, what that means is there's only a certain amount of carbon that can go into the atmosphere, which will lead to concentrations and warming that would lead to a two degree C, right? You can, we can back out that math with a fair degree of, of, of certainty. And that means if you took all the oil and gas and coal companies in the world and look at their balance sheet and looked at how much they they uh, list as holding in, in reserves, more than half of that has to get be left in the ground. It doesn't even get into all the unconventional stuff because the unconventional stuff is not listed on the current balance sheet because it's currently not technically, uh, not economically viable to produce. So, there's, so th that's the fundamental challenge that we face. How do we keep this carbon in, uh, in the ground, continue to meet demand in the rich world, uh, eliminate energy poverty in the developing world. 1.3 billion people in the world don't have electricity. Right? And so to raise those people out of, of poverty, they need access to modern energy services. So how do we do uh, all of that? 
and, and do this. That's the, that's the challenge. The good news is that there are, uh, from the supply side, options out there. So this shows the potential of uh, renewable energy, particularly in regards to the generation of electricity. And it shows for solar energy, hydro, wind, biomass, and so on, the technical potential, how much is actually, if you look at all the sunlight that falls on the terrestrial land surface, what fraction of that technically, forget about economics again, technically how much of that could you grab and convert into uh, electricity? And a lot of uncertainty and debate about how much, you know, just where can you put the solar panels and what is the efficiency going to be and so on and so forth. There's a lot of uncertainty. But uh, it's at least probably 20 times the total electricity that we currently generate in the planet in a year. And it maybe is 300 times. So solar energy has tremendous technical potential for meeting uh, electricity demands. Hydropower uh, has a much smaller potential, largely because we've dammed all the big rivers in the world, pretty much. Uh, a few places where it has some uh, potential to expand. Uh, wind energy is uh, anywhere between one and five times uh, what we currently uh, generate. Geothermal energy has a large range, depending on how, what, how optimistic you are about using low-grade uh, thermal energy and uh, ocean energy, capturing waves and tides and so on. So the good news, and this is just electricity use, so this doesn't speak to, you know, this assumes that we're going to electrify a lot of uh, our life, particularly cars uh, and uh, uh, replace in other fuels, but there's a lot of renewable energy, right? So quantity-wise, uh, There's good news. So the unburnable carbon suggests that change has to happen fast. And probably faster than we saw in the beginning of that first graph where these transitions play, took decades to play out, right? We need to move faster than that. And the good news is that rapid change is possible on a massive scale, right? The world got together in a very short period of time, eradicated smallpox, just completely eradicated, almost completely eradicated. Now it's starting to come back because of all those all the nut cases we don't want to immunize the children. But anyways, I digress. Um, the Green Revolution. So Q Foundation, the national governments uh, uh, came together uh, with the goal of eliminating starvation. And in a, again, a relatively short period of time, develop high yield varieties of wheat, rice, and maize, and a few other major grain crops. And global starvation was not completely, but largely wiped out. India, the classic example where India, when the monsoons failed and then the, prior to the 1960s, millions of people, literally millions of people were dying in India. And malnutrition is still an issue in India, but in some years, uh, at least in the 1990s, India exported food. Then there's the Manhattan Project, right? The government, U.S. government opened up the you know, checkbook and said we're going to build a city in Hanford, Washington. We're going to hire all the best scientists in the world and we're going to build a bomb. And they went from, 1939 was the, we hadn't even learned, learned how to fission an atom of uranium until 1939. By 1945, we had developed a weapon. Right? So, so rapid change is possible. Now, these are quite different than the carbon issue because these are clear and present danger kind of stuff. Right? So it's easy to get people motivated to limit smallpox or you know, fight, uh, fight the Nazis. So climate change is a, a different kettle of fish. But it is possible if uh, we get enough people and institutions on board. So here are some of the challenges, the barriers that we face. And one is sort of uh, the technological lock -in. So we are, we have a, the energy infrastructure in the world is largely fossil fuels, pipelines, drilling rigs, oil platforms, oil tankers, oil refineries. And they last a long time when you build one. And so uh, once a company builds uh, something like that, they want to try to stuff it with the fuel that goes through it to make the money and keep the people employed uh, and so on. And what we see in the world today is this ongoing substantial investment in what we call the upstream energy sector. So the exploration for oil and gas and the building of, of uh, liquefied natural gas. So in Qatar, you know, a tiny country with huge gas reserves, 
they're building facilities to liquefy gas, put them on the tanker, ship them to uh, around the world. Uh, the Keystone Pipeline is another example, which would bring oil from the oil sands in Alberta to the Gulf of Mexico ports, um, is a big, expensive capital investment. Once you build a pipeline, let me tell you, as we know from Alaska and Prudhoe Bay, once a pipeline is built, the oil comes to do anything to keep oil stuffed in it. In Alaska, they built the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, uh, which started flowing in 1977 to bring oil from the north slope of Alaska, Prudhoe Bay, 700 miles across Alaska to the port of Valdez, where it's put in uh, tankers to go to refiners in California. Where Prudhoe Bay production is dropping like a stone, that, that flow through that pipeline is dropping like a stone. And so now they want to drill everywhere in Alaska to try to build trunk pipelines to keep feeding the Trans-Alaska uh, pipeline. So uh, we get locked into these uh, investments and uh, prevents new re renewables from, from breaking in. Another issue with these transitions is that they take a long, historically, they've taken a long time to play out. So this is the same day that you saw the first graph. Sorry, I'm moving, camera folks. Uh, percentage of each uh, energy source. So for example, if you take the transition from wood here to coal, which is here, you know, coal from the time it was four or five percent to the time there was, a, you know, a quarter of energy use was 40 years. 40 years. If you look at the substitution of oil for coal, again, it was a marginal fuel for a long time. And it wasn't until 50, almost 40 or 50 years after it was discovered until it became a dominant source of energy. So historically, these energy transitions have taken a long time to play out when they're left to their own devices, right? When we don't actively manage them and steer them in a particular uh, direction. That's my a little engine that could. Solar is not on there because it doesn't. Well, uh, is it? I guess it's not. Here's another example of transition. So this is world energy use. Uh, actually, no, this is world. Uh, is this world? Wait, 10,000, 15,000. Yes, this is world electricity generation, billions of kilowatt hours by different sources. So conventional thermal means burning coal, oil, or gas to generate electricity. Uh, hydropower, uh, nuclear, and uh, non-hydro-renewable. Non so this is wind and solar. And the whole point of this is that if you look at the percentage of the fossil fuels in 1980, it's almost exactly what it is now. Yeah, that's amazing if you think about that. So 30 years have gone by. We've fought wars over oil, climate change, all kinds of issues related to fossil fuels. Renewables have uh, barely made a dent. Now, they're moving quickly, uh, especially in Europe, but it's still a tiny smidgen of, of total capacity. Another barrier to the shift to low carbon fuels are unpriced uh, externalities. So an externality, who knows what an externality is? I'm going to put one of my students on the spot. Someone has to raise their hand first. Thank you. Um, an externality is the cost that's not actually put into the price of the good, so it's just like a negative externality would be like pollution, um, but that's not included in the price of the good, but it is affected by the people who buy the good. So. Exactly, very good. Um, so an externality, as she eloquently uh, just put it, is a cost imposed on society from the production of a good that the users of that good do not pay. So in the case of uh, air pollution, you burn coal, the coal blows up, forms acid rain, it falls uh, on a lake or a stream and destroys the fish and or acidifies the water. So people who fish there, or people who extract water from that are faced with a cost of cleanup or some other type of cost, but that's not included in the cost of the coal, the electricity from the, by the people who purchase the, like, purchase of the electricity from the plant that caused the problem. And so from a market perspective, that coal is too cheap and there's too much of it being produced and consumed. And so uh, the externalities associated with fossil fuels are massive and large. Coal in particular. There was a study done by uh, Bill Nordhaus and Robert Mendelson at, at Yale, economists at Yale University who looked at the externalities associated with coal in the United States 
states and their value, the dollar value of those externalities, the impact on health, climate, ecosystems, and so on, was greater than the contribution of the whole coal economy to the economy measured in dollars, which means that if the market appropriately priced them, the coal industry would shut down. It's not an economically viable entity. Another uh, problem with the market has to do with subsidies. So subsidies are payouts from the government to a particular form of energy uh, that, may, again, it, in effect, lowers the cost to the firm producing that energy. So in the case of fossil fuels, for example, uh, the oil and gas industry gets to write off on its tax returns, the depreciation of its capital, its drilling rates, way faster than other businesses uh, can do it, but right? because of a government law that enabled them to do that. Nuclear power plants have uh, indemnification of insurance. Nuclear power operators can't get insurance in the private insurance market. No one would insure a nuclear power plant. So the government limits their liability and enables them to work. So. If you look at, this is some work from the International Energy Agency, the total global fossil fuels are about half a trillion dollars a year. Renewables are a small fraction of it. So the playing field is, is tilted towards, uh, towards the fossil fuels in terms of government subsidies. Another issue and a big uh, point of debate are the cost of renewables. And a lot of people who oppose uh, active dumping of fossil fuels in favor of renewables say, oh, well, renewables cost more, so if we make that shift, we're going to impose electricity and other fuels are going to be more expensive for consumers. You're going to raise costs. And uh, that's a complicated question. Uh, so here's uh, a table of big numbers that I'm going to try to simplify for the United States. <clears throat> so this shows what's called a levelized cost of electricity. What it shows is that if you build a, a wind turbine or a nuclear power plant, it costs so much to build it, maintain it, operate it, and then dispose of it when it's done, over its whole lifetime. It will produce a certain amount of electricity over its lifetime. And you simply divide that lifetime cost by the amount of electricity it produces, and you have an estimate of the levelized cost of energy. So <clears throat> this table distinguishes between what are called dispatchable technologies and non-dispatchable technologies. These are technologies that are variable. The wind obviously doesn't always Blow and the sun doesn't always uh, shine. So most of our gas in the United States today is being generated with uh, conventional combined cycle gas, which costs about seventy-five dollars uh, per per megawatt per, per megawatt hour. Excuse me. Coal is also another big source of energy. Conventional coal is about ninety-five cents, um, ninety-five dollars. Excuse me per, per megawatt hour. Here are some uh, estimates by the Department of Energy on what new coal technologies would be. And new coal and gas technologies, if you combine them with carbon capture and storage, which is essentially a way of just taking the smokestack from a power plant burning coal and sticking it in the ground and stuffing the carbon somewhere down the earth and hoping that it just goes somewhere and stays away for, well, I don't know, about a million years. So it doesn't go in the atmosphere. And you can see that raises the cost considerably. Uh, nuclear, advanced nuclear. It's about the same as coal, although we, this is a total guesstimate because we're not actually building any new power plants. A couple in Georgia, but we don't really know what this cost is. If we were to build them, this is an estimate of what it would cost. Then if you look at non-dispatchable technology, so onshore wind, notably, so onshore wind is already competitive with gas. And this is with no subsidies for wind at all, or any of the renewable technologies. So onshore wind is competitive with gas and way better than coal. Now, there's regional variations in this. This is a national average, but onshore gas is already expensive. Offshore, offshore, excuse me, onshore wind is competitive. Offshore wind is still uh, more expensive. Expensive. Solar PV is uh, also more expensive, <clears throat> but uh, certainly better than, than coal if you're going to actually deal with some of the carbon externalities associated with coal. Most importantly, uh, these renewable technologies are experiencing very rapid cost to to what is called learning by doing. As you learn how to do something over time, as you get experience, the cost of producing it go down. And so this is uh, the price of silicon, crystal and silicon PV in the United States. And the vertical axis shows the price of a, uh, of a 
watt of, of, of PV compared to its cumulative production. So as you accumulate experience, you can see that costs go down. And the learning rate is 24%. What this means is that for every doubling of cumulative production, the cost of solar photovoltaics dropped has dropped by 24% over this period. So as more and more countries and industries start to produce uh, solar PV, the costs are dropping rapidly. So the, the numbers in the table I just showed you are a snapshot in time, and the numbers for wind and solar are dropping quickly. The numbers for natural gas combined cycle and coal are pretty flat because they're mature technologies. So renewables are becoming increasingly uh, cost uh, effective. Another barrier is the power of the carbon corporations. If you Google largest corporations in the world, I think 17 out of 20 are cell fossil fuels. And these are some of uh, the big ones. Note that uh, a couple of things, so ExxonMobil and Chevron, you probably know, uh, Petrobras is uh, the Brazilian uh, company, the state grid of, of China, and uh, Boy, this is Japan, China, China, China. Uh, are both owned by the state, as is Gazprom, uh, which is the Russian uh, natural gas company, as is uh, the Venezuelan national oil company, as is Total, which is the French uh, big oil <laughs> and gas company. So the combination of private and public companies here, and. Uh, they're big and extremely powerful. And we know from our experience in the United States, they have a huge influence over what happens in the United States in terms of policy. A couple of anecdotes. One, uh, during the uh, George Bush, the second administration, Dick Cheney, the vice president, was head of the big, big energy policy summit where they were gonna pass some, some new energy laws. And uh, his quote was, which he said just right out there was that, Energy conservation may be a personal virtue, but it's not the basis for a sound national energy policy. And, you know, okay. And it turns out that the meetings they were having lit in the West Wing were filled with these companies. And all the energy efficiency people were like, read to read the final report, uh, literally. So just, just ball political, uh, political power. And we know, for example, recently that uh, Exxon actually uh, had funded a lot of research in the 70s which pointed, their own scientists pointed to what we now know are the facts related to climate change and uh, they chose to, uh, to act, act otherwise. So this is a huge problem, huge problem. Uh, and I'll, I'll end by just coming back to the demand side. I put these guys up there because um, if you look at the energy speeches and energy, energy policies of all of these guys after this guy, they are overwhelmingly oriented on, on the supply side. We gotta build pipelines, we have to drill more, we have to open up land uh, to, to drill, we have to build more power plants. Very little attention played, uh, paid on the demand side, in part because of what this happened to this guy, <laughs> so it's Jimmy Carter. So, Jimmy, so in 1979, uh, we were in the midst of a rapid uh, oil shock due to the uh, overthrow of the Shah in Iran, the nationalization of the Iranian oil industry. They took 300 and some hostages, American hostages. Uh, we had, now that was an energy crisis. We had, uh, imagine this, if your license plate ended in an odd number, you could only buy gas on odd number days of the calendar. Literally a shortage of, of oil and gas. So Carter came on and said, he came on a, a fireside chat, he was in the Roosevelt room, he had a fire behind him, he had a, a cardigan sweater on, and he basically said, you know, we have a serious problem, and it's the way in which we use energy as Americans, and we need to conserve. Well, that, that speech decapitated him politically. It's now known, Google the, Google the Malay speech, and you'll find the reference to Carter's speech, and people didn't want to hear it. Don't tell me what I can, how big a car I can drive, or what temperature I can keep my house at. This is America, damn it. We didn't, we produced our way to greatness. We didn't conserve our way to greatness. And everyone since then, Republican and Democrat alike, it's been overwhelmingly on the supply side. So we need to get back to the demand side because that's where a lot of the uh, opportunities lie. 
as is indicated in, in this graph, some work done by a consulting company, uh, McKenzie and Company, and what it shows them on the vertical axis is what it would cost to abate, to, to reduce a ton of carbon dioxide equipment. So these are all the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and so on, uh, adjusted for the global warming tension. And what it would cost to reduce by one ton carbon dioxide. And so you notice that there's positive and negative numbers. And so as you move in this direction, it becomes more expensive to reduce carbon emissions. And the point of this graph is that most of the supply side stuff is over here, right? So we have a new combined cycle gas plant, coal with carbon capture and storage, uh, building new more nuclear power plants, which are good from a carbon perspective because they produce very little carbon. But notice that over here with supposedly negative costs are a lot of demand side stuff, right? More efficient appliances uh, in residential, heating, ventilating, and air conditioned cars, all kinds of stuff in the demands, and they have negative costs indicating that, that literally we could have our cake and eat it too. We could uh, abate carbon and also do it and, and save money at the same time. Now there's a lot of debate over the, the veracity of these numbers. Robert's shaking his head, and he might have something to say, but, but I, the rank ordering is, is probably correct at some general level, that the supply side options are more expensive, and we can do it more cheaply with uh, on, uh, on the demand side. Okay, just a couple things to close here. I know I don't want to use some time for questions. Well, a couple of the points I've made, net energy transition is fundamentally different because of the carbon constraint, which we now face. So we literally, we as a society, some combination of, of, of people, households, institutions, governments, companies, NGOs, 350.orgs, Net, net impacts. As a society, we need to steer the super tanker in a different direction. The scale of the transition is very large. The total amount of energy we have to supply now on a global scale is way bigger than it was when we went from coal to oil. And we also need to do, as I mentioned, we need to do this and eliminate energy poverty. That is, we have to, and we have an obligation to the developing world to supply them with modern energy sources, which enables them to move out of poverty and also reduce severe health impacts. One of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in the developing world is women and children sitting in rooms where you're burning animal dung and wood and inhaling the particulates. It kills you. It makes you very sick. Uh, again, we need to focus on both energy supply and energy end use. And be not only thinking about what are the cool new energy technologies out there to reduce carbon, but also what are the cool new energy end uses? Are they fuel cell cars? Or what are they that will help drive the supply side uh, transition? And we also know pretty clearly now that the market alone will not send socially optimal signals regarding the timing of transition. And so this implies government intervention. And as we're heading into election year cycle, so you know that in the United States, this is a clear dividing line between the Republicans and the Democrats. Republicans, government, bad. Just ideologically bad. Democrats, government, good. We need government for things like this. It's a fundamental dividing line. And uh, we're going to have to deal with, uh, deal with that dividing line in some fundamental way if we hope to uh, address this. Because if we don't use the market to help drive this transition, then it's going to happen probably way too much slower than we want to. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks. And uh, thanks.